Hello and uh, welcome to this uh, AutoWare workshop. Um, uh, the idea of this being to talk about AutoWare, the world's first um, complete uh, open source uh, autonomous driving system, uh, to talk about what it does, um, a bit about its architecture, to give you a chance to do some hands-on exercises with it, uh, and then also to talk about the ecosystem around AutoWare, some of the projects that the AutoWare Foundation has sponsored globally, and to talk about things like future developments um, about AutoWare and uh, AutoWare's partnership with ARM. So, a little bit about myself. My name is Lannis Bippelanenden. I am a support manager uh, working, I am the support manager, I should say, uh, support manager working at um, Tier 4, uh, a startup based out of Japan, uh, Tokyo, and Tokyo, Japan, that is uh, primarily concerned with providing services around um, AutoWare uh, with the mission of uh, providing intelligent vehicles for everyone. So in terms of career history, I um, graduated with a physics degree of all things, and then uh, worked in the financial services industry for around 10 years as a developer. After that, at around 2012, I moved into technical support, uh, moving to Japan in 2016, and then joining Tier 4 earlier this year. And um, being based out of Japan explains why you're watching a pre-record session uh, versus a live session, because at the time you'll be watching this, it's going to be about three in the morning in Japan, and I am most likely going to be asleep. So apologies for that, but um, I'm sure we'll be fine. Um, in terms of hobbies, um, I'm about as nerdy as they come. I've been playing computer games since 1982, starting the BBC Micro and BBC Master, and then upgrading to an Acorn Archimedes A3000 uh, around 1987, which was my uh, first experience of uh, an ARM-based chip. Uh, and then from there, I kind of moved on to PC gaming and now console gaming. Uh, I also play guitar badly, which is uh, heavy to death metal uh, for any fans out there. I also read comics, uh, science, uh, science fiction fancy books, and I love watching films. Uh, unfortunately, my wife shares almost none of these hobbies, uh, with the exception of watching films, um, but she's very understanding and is happy to let me go on with things, providing uh, my hobbies do not intrude upon the common areas of our flat. So uh, moving on, the first thing I'd like to do is, um, is do a first hands-on exercises right now. Um, so for these hands-on exercises, we'll be using Tier 4's uh, AutoWare online system, uh, which uses AWS uh, virtual machines uh, as a basis and, basic, and, and it comes with AutoWare pre-installed and pre-built and installed for people to just kind of spin up and just use to get a taste of what AutoWare is like. Uh, these instances shouldn't take that long to set up, but they could take a they could take a little while because um, the VM instances are based out of Japan, uh, as is the AutoWare Online portal. Uh, so uh, I would like to get everyone set up on with those now, um, just to make sure um, when we actually come to the real part for hands-on exercises, everyone's instances are all ready to go. So. I have a pre-recorded video to that effect. Okay, so welcome to exercise one, where we're going to be setting up uh, your AutoWare online test environment for use. All things have gone well. Uh, you should have received an email from uh, no-reply-autoware.online. Um, that looks similar to the following. Um, and then we're going to proceed from there. So this is what that email looks like for me. Um, the email will contain your username, should just be your email address. It's also going to contain a temporary password, which you will need to change on first login. So I'm going to copy this, click on the link, and then it's going to prompt me to sign in. With my username and password. Uh, do you want to save? And then I'm going to have to change this to something. So 
uh, your password must contain a lowercase letter, an uppercase letter, a number, and be at least eight characters. And then click send, and then we'll log in. Now this button, it, for me, it immediately says launch. Uh, sometimes this may say loading. Uh, it should show launch after a few seconds. If it does not, then just simply uh, refresh the browser page, and it, you then should see the launch button appear. So. Click, I'm going to click launch, and in this dialog, I'm going to accept the default version that's set on Dev Summit and just click on the create button. Now, this process can take a minute, um, it can take longer. What will eventually happen is this loading button will change um, from saying loading to saying uh, connect, and then all you will do is connect on the button, uh, a new tab will appear, and you will be able to log in to your uh, VM, but uh, rather than make you all wait for a minute or however long it's going to take, I'm going to stop and skip ahead to the next part uh, where I'm able to connect. Um, but for the rest of you, if you're still not able to connect, then what I would suggest is you keep the tab open and you, you close the tab, uh, sorry, you keep this tab open and um, just periodically check in as we continue on through the rest of the workshop and hopefully everything will be ready in time for uh, the start of the next hands-on exercise. Um, in my case, it did work, so it did come up quite quickly. So I'm gonna click on connect. I get a new tab come up. Um, but again, at this point, you may get this black screen. Uh, you may get a fail to connect um, uh, screen pop up. There you go connection failed. Um, so if that happens, click, try clicking on reconnect. Didn't work. Going to try another time. Didn't work. Uh, so if this is what happens to you, um, I would leave it for a few minutes. Please leave, close the tab, leave it for a few minutes, and then come back and click on connect. But uh, in the next part of the video, I'm actually going to skip ahead to the point where my VM has been set up and I'm able to connect. Okay, so let's move on and show the next video. Um, okay, so I've skipped ahead a bit. Uh, the VM, the creation of the VM can take a minute, just over a minute. It can take longer, depending, because in addition to being created, uh, we also download a data file, which is a few hundred megabytes worth of data uh, that we're going to use in the other hands-on exercises, and that can add on to the total time um, for the VM to be set up. So uh, now I know my VM is, is, is running. So I'm going to click on the connect button and a new tab will open. And then in the Ubuntu login prompt, I'm going to type in password, which is autoware, all lowercase, same as the username. And I am presented with the Ubuntu desktop. And you should see this hand-on folder. That means the data is downloaded has been unpacked. Um, if you see, you may see a zip archive icon um, instead of this folder. And that means the data is still in the process of being downloaded and unpacked. So you're going to have to give it another minute or two for that to complete. Uh, the other point to note is that uh, you, your input language may be set to Japanese uh, by default. If that's the case, then you can just change that to English, which I assume is going to be the preferred input language for the majority of people uh, joining the workshop. And, um, and that's it. So that's the end of exercise one. You're all ready to go. And uh, we'll be back to the workshop for some more talking about auto and some more information about autoware. Uh, and then we'll continue with the other hands-on exercises. Okay, so hopefully everyone was able to get through that. Uh, if not, uh, then as I mentioned, please keep uh, a tab open and keep checking uh, periodically. Like give it a couple of minutes and then try and connect again and see if you're able to log in as we continue on. So uh, enough about me and enough with the hands-on exercises, uh, that initial hands-on exercise. And let's talk about autoware. So mostly what is it and why should you care about it? Um, autoware is the turn my video back on 
Uh, AutoAir is um, the first all-in-one um, open source uh, software for autonomous driving. And it was developed in um, 2015, originally created in 2015 by Shinpei Kato at Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, Shinpei Kato is the CTO and founder of Tier 4. Uh, and it was based on the open source ROS uh, middleware, ROS being robot operating system. And it's complete, uh, it's independent of vehicle type or electronic hardware, uh, it's governed by an independent foundation, and it is completely open source. Now, why is that important? You might think, okay, there are other open source projects out there, right? Uh, the, the fact is, as it's completely open source, anyone can download it and play around with the AutoWare simulator on their computer. Um, I mean, it will run on a laptop, basically, need about eight cores, 16 gigs of RAM, and a, C a GPU with five gigs of RAM, but it will run. Um, or you can buy a test vehicle, uh, have drive-by-wire components installed, uh, hook up a computer to it that's running Ubuntu and AutoWare, and you can run that vehicle autonomously. But why is this important? I keep talking about open source, anyone can do it, why? The fact remains that uh, developing a fully autonomous vehicle uh, poses a great deal of complex challenges, many of which are yet to be solved. And uh, the exploration of these challenges was essentially limited to large companies uh, such as Waymo and Uber, who are able to throw uh, vast sums of money at the problem. But that's still a limited number of people, even these huge companies with a massive amount of resources and money. It's still limiting the number of people that can work on it by making uh, developing an open source uh, automated driving system or software rather uh, that that is auto aware uh, this these challenges are being opened up to people who are interested in academic research or just people who are interested in automated driving and want to kind of dabble in it uh, and the idea being that having a large number of people approaching these kind of problems uh, working on these problems together in collaboration uh, can help improve the chances of those challenges being overcome. So to give a bit of context around AutoWare and its versions, uh, AutoWare.ai uh, was the very first version of AutoWare that was developed and based on the ROS1 middleware and was intended for proof of concept research testing only rather than being in a production system. Uh, the current version is 1.14 and uh, 1.15 is due to be released in December of this year. Uh, from January, uh, AutoWare.ai will go into maintenance mode, uh, which basically means that no features, new features will be added and there will, uh, patch releases will be uh, those containing bug fixes only. And then at the end of 2022, AutoWare.ai will reach its end of life uh, where there'll be no new releases and no new uh, pull requests accepted. Um, next at the bottom, we have AutoWare to AutoWare Auto. And this is a ground up redesign of AutoWare based on the ROS2 middleware and is aimed at production level systems. Uh, this version of AutoWare is currently in development with uh, its initial target use case of uh, automatic valet parking. And uh, hopefully, a demo of that will be completed uh, this month. And then in between the two, we have the AutoWare Architecture Proposal Code, which is an architectural redesign of AutoWare.ai based uh, or created by Tier 4 uh, with the aim to reduce the tight coupling uh, between components of AutoWare to facilitate open source contributions. Uh, basically speaking, if you wanted to make a small change to a system, because of the coupling, you'd have to test a large amount of code just to just even just to test a, a small change. And so by reducing that coupling, we're enabling people to make smaller changes and to test them quickly. And with the idea of this helping to make it more friendly to, to new contributors. And uh, tier four is currently working with the AutoWare Foundation uh, to merge this proposal into the uh, AutoWare to Auto project. And some of you may now be thinking, what is this AutoWare Foundation, which he, he's speaking? Uh, I'm glad you asked, and that because that's the subject of our next slide. So, what what's the the plan? The Autoware Foundation is there to essentially monitor, sponsor, and guide uh, projects that are using uh, 
Autoware uh, with the aim of building uh, a global community that collaborates and works together. Um, although Autoware was created um, and made into an open source project, um, it, it couldn't really be considered truly independent uh, as an open source project being made under, uh, under the control of tier four, uh, which it was uh, in the initial stages. Uh, and so the creation of the Autoware Foundation, which was established by tier four Apex.ai and Lenar in 2018, was, to, was set up to provide independent guidance uh, for Autoware development activity and to encourage worldwide collaboration. Uh, there are currently 53 members as of August 2020, with a technical steering committee and a number of working groups set up to foster that uh, global collaboration. Uh, and if you look to the right, some of the logos on the right of that slide show you uh, some of the members uh, of the Autoware Foundation. But to kind of put that into, into perspective in terms of regional split and the kind of global uh, breadth or depth of uh, Autoware use, um, this slide shows uh, some of the activities that are some of the projects that are using Autoware being sponsored by the Autoware Foundation and the kind of mix up or the, the, the kind of breakdown of uh, members worldwide. So we have 16 members in North America, we have 12 in Europe, we have 11 in Asia, uh, excluding Japan and then 14 in Japan uh, itself. Great. Uh, and so next uh, is to show a couple of demo videos uh, to give you an idea of what Autoware uh, can do. So this video is showing the uh, Miley service, uh, which is operating in a park in Japan. And um, the, the point being, uh, one of the points being, when, when people think of autonomous vehicles, most people are thinking about cars, uh, but that's just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, as I mentioned, Autoware is independent of vehicle type. Uh, and so it can be used in anything that you want, really, um, providing you have the appropriate drive-by-wire components put in um, and you, hook, you can hook up a computer to it that's running Autoware, you can drive just about anything. Um, and so this is a kind of a fully autonomous shuttle service that's running. And it can use, you can use uh, customers or users can uh, use a smartphone app to, to call a vehicle. Um, to uh, a designated point uh, along, a, uh, along a route that the, that the vehicles follow within the park and then moves to the next stop. Okay. So this next video is showing um, the use of AutoWare to drive um, a, a vehicle inside a factory uh, that's, basic, that's being used to deliver components around the factory. And um, this is uh, based on a, a golf cart. So again, these are relatively, um, the, the environment which are operating are relatively simple in the, in the park, it's a private road and the factory, um, uh, it's also, well, it's, uh, I think in, in the park, it's a public road, it's restricted um, in terms of the number of vehicle, vehicles that travel on it. And then within the factory, it's private to the, uh, the factory and the only vehicles that operate are this, these autonomous vehicles and maybe like the forklift truck that we saw pass by. Okay, so let's uh, move on to our first real um, hands-on exercise where we'll be looking at RVs um, 
and uh, basic playback of uh, recorded sensor data. On the assumption that uh, everyone was able to start up their AutoWare Online VM in exercise one, uh, we're now going to go on to exercise two, which is, as the title says, which I'm hoping you can all read, uh, is RVIS basics and replaying a ROS bag. Uh, so the purpose of this exercise is to gain some familiarity with the basic functionality of RVIS and how to replay a ROS bag. Uh, as I said, RVIS is essentially a 3D visualization tool for the ROS middleware that AutoWare is based on, and ROS bag is the file format used to record and playback data. Uh, from a ROS based system. So the first thing we're going to do is to launch RVIS uh, to start uh, a ROS bag playback and then pause it um, immediately. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, the commands are all here for reference, uh, but there is a text file that's included in the hands on uh, folder uh, in, on the VM instance uh, that has all of these commands. So you can, although copy and paste functionality from your host computers, the VM is not possible. Uh, you can use copy and paste on the VM itself. So you can just copy from the text file um, to the terminal, or you can um, type them out if that's what you'd prefer to do. Um, I'm going to be doing a mixture. So you probably want to copy if you want to follow along uh, as we're going through. So. Okay, I'm going to go to my VM instance, which you should all be able to see. Um, I'm going to click on Terminator to open a terminal, make my window a bit bigger. And I'm going to split this vertically because I'm going to need two terminals, as mentioned. I'm going to use uh, Alt plus A to broadcast. So the commands I type in one terminal will appear in the second terminal. And I'm going to change directory to the autoware.proj directory. From there, I'm going to run the source command to get our environment set up. And then, and this is important, uh, I'm going to press Alt and then O to turn off broadcast. So now I can paste, I can put separate commands into each window and they're now going to run independently. Um, so if we go to the hands-on folder and then open this exercise commands.txt, uh, these are the two commands I just ran in both windows. And then in, the, for me, you can do either one, but uh, for, in one terminal, I'm going to run a uh, ROS launch command, which will load up RVIS. Okay, and this is what you should see. Um, I'm going to go back and I'm going to take this command, which is in my uh, the command that's going to replay the ROS bag, and I'm going to run this in the second terminal window. And I'm going to let it run for a few seconds, and I'm going to press the space bar to pause it. Um, Right. So in terms of adjusting our view, we're in this uh, top-down ortho view, which is uh, a two-dimensional uh, view. And essentially, you can move around this view with the mouse and keyboard um, by, uh, if you click and hold the left mouse button, uh, it rotates the view like this. If I hold down the right mouse button and then move the mouse, it zooms in and out. If your mouse has a mouse wheel, the mouse wheel has you, uh, does the same function. Uh, and if I wanted to pan around the map, if I hold down the shift key, um, and then click the left mouse button, and move, I can move the view around like that. Okay. So from here, I'm going to change to the third person follower view. 
So in the views panel on the left, I click in the type top down box, click on third person follower, and then I'm going to change the target frame to base link. And base link represents the central point of the rear axle of the vehicle. And then I'm going to click zero. And hopefully you should now see something like this. And in the same way, the, the commands or the, the ways in which you can adjust this view are much the same or similar at least to the top down auto view. If I click and hold the left mouse button, um, it allows me to rotate the view. Uh, I can even pan, it's three dimensional, so you can actually go underneath the vehicle if you, if you want to. Um, if I click and hold the right mouse button and move, it zooms me in and out. And then if I hold down the shift key, click the left mouse button, uh, the view will pan across. So I'm going to leave my view roughly like this. And then I'm going to go back to the right side uh, terminator, uh, the right side terminal where uh, we had the Rossback paused. Just click in the window, just to click in the in the terminal to make sure it's active. And then I'm going to hit the space bar to resume playback. And I click back on Arvis. Playback is being resumed. Um, we also mentioned this is kind of partly uh, to do with LiDAR detection. So essentially what we're seeing is, is, is LiDAR data. There's, there's no camera image data, it's just LiDAR data. And this LiDAR data is being used um, within and by auto and is being processed and objects that we, um, uh, we recognize, uh, we're basically using that processing to try and identify the objects that are around us. So on the right, uh, two of these, um, these are essentially other vehicles and the road next to us have been identified and um, a bounding box has been drawn around them with the kind of rough shape. Um, the shape of an average car essentially is used to, to bound that box. Um, one of the other things we can do here is under sensing, um, not just sensing, but these, uh, the displays panel shows, is, is used to control what is being displayed in RVs. And so uh, the example you gave is under LiDAR, we have this uh, concatenate um, point cloud data, and we can basically turn it off or toggle it on and off with the checkbox. And then for the no ground point cloud data, we can also do the same. We can turn it on and off. And this is something you can do. You can essentially control. So you can customize the view um, to your preference because a lot of this data is, it can be useful. Maybe this data is not particularly, uh, is too much you're seeing too much and it's kind of too much to take in. You want kind of a simpler view of what's going on when you're looking at your Ross bag. Um, so that's something you can customize and you can actually save your preferences as an RVs configuration file. Okay, so the playback is finished. So I will Go back to my terminal. We can see that the uh, Rossbag Rossbag playback has completed, um, but the, the the command that's running RBS, the Ros launch uh, command, is still running. So I'm going to click on the left side terminal and hit Control C to end the command or kill the command, and then I'm going to close the window. Terminator window, and that is the end of exercise uh, two. Okay, so continuing onwards, uh, let's talk a bit about the architecture. So how does it all work? How does Autoware do this thing it's doing? 
Um, essentially, auto OS sits in between the sensors um, required to perceive the environment around the car, such as a LiDAR sensor, camera, uh, GNSS sensor, global navigation satellite system, so essentially GPS. Um, it sits between those sensors uh, and the vehicle's drive-by-wire interface. And drive-by-wire interface is the components you put in to allow the car to be driven electronically. Um, and Autoware then takes uh, data from the sensors. It takes feedback data from the vehicle itself uh, and map data as well uh, in order to autonomously control the vehicle. So Autoware receives um, uh, data via three modules. Uh, the sensing, uh, map, and vehicle interface modules. And uh, this information is used um, within Autoware as follows. So uh, sense data is provided to localization, perception, and planning. Uh, map data is provided to localization, perception, and control. Uh, and then after processing is done in these modules, Autoware will send control, uh, vehicle control signals to the vehicle's drive-by-wire interface. Uh, so to cover that in a little more detail, uh, sensing, sensing is essentially in charge of taking raw data from the sensors and uh, doing some pre-processing on that as required and converting it into messages that the rest of Autoware can easily understand. Um, map data, we need uh, two types of maps. We need uh, a HD uh, point cloud map, um, which is used for localization. Uh, localization being the determination of where the vehicle is in relation to its environment. Um, and then we also have a, a type of map called a vector map. And a vector map contains metadata about the environment. So it will include data about intersections or junctions, uh, stop lines, uh, pedestrian crossings, traffic lights, that kind of thing. Uh, also things like speed limits are all in the vector map. Um, and then those information, uh, that information is passed on to perception uh, and perception is used to determine uh, objects or to do recognition uh, of objects around the car. So uh, object recognition is dynamic objects. So other vehicles, pedestrians, uh, motorcyclists, um, and uh, it's in charge of using sense data to detect them, uh, to identify them uh, as best as we can. Uh, to track those objects and then to predict where those objects are going to travel to so that we can not only avoid collisions but we can avoid collisions based on prediction of where we think those those objects are going to travel to in the future. Uh, also within perception is traffic light recognition so we need to detect traffic lights so your traffic light will be defined in your map data um, and then we need to take a camera image of that traffic light uh, and then classify it to say, okay, here's a traffic light. What is it? Is it red? Is it green? Is it an arrow? Is it not an arrow? So uh, we can take then uh, appropriate action uh, in terms of slowing down at a red light, for example, slowing down and stopping for a red light. Um, information from perception is then passed on to uh, planning. And planning is, is broken up into two major parts, mission and scenario. So the mission says, okay, so given an initial pose, uh, when we say pose, uh, pose is uh, position and angle of the vehicle. So given an initial pose and a goal pose, uh, and given the information we have about the roads from our map data, our vector map data, what's the best route to get us to that goal pose? And then from there, that information from mission is then passed on to the scenario, and it's at which um, will basically modify the behavior of the vehicle accordingly. So it will modify the behavior uh, based on uh, junctions um, or kind of uh, parts within the, the road itself, like it said, intersection stop lines, uh, traffic lights, uh, and also how will it respond to obstacles. So if an obstacle is detected, how do we, uh, that kind of avoidance is built into the scenario part and that will adjust the, the path the vehicle takes. And then all of that's then passed on to the uh, control interface, which then converts those into uh, signals that the drive-by-wire interface will understand. Uh, just a last point about um, definitions. We'll talk about, I will talk about the ego vehicle 
Uh, and when I say ego vehicle, I mean the, the, the autonomously driven vehicle itself. Okay, so, so enough about architecture, it's time for another hands-on exercise. Okay, so now we're gonna move on to exercise three, which is where we will be um, demonstrating some of uh, Autoware's localization functionality using NDT scan matching. As you can say, um, at a basic level, entity scan matching is an algorithm that's used to match uh, LIDAR sensor data that's, um, that's, being, that's coming from the sensors in the vehicle and provided to AutoWare, um, and kind of matching that with the existing LIDAR point cloud map uh, in order to determine where the EGO vehicle is located. And that process of determining where the EGO vehicle is located is called localization. Um, and if you want to know more about how the algorithm works, uh, you can read this uh, the Medium article uh, by David Silver that's linked in the instructions. Um, so in the past, AutoWare uh, essentially, in order to localize the vehicle, uh, it was necessary for the initial pose, uh, pose being the position and angle of the vehicle, uh, that initial pose had to be set manually. Um, or you had to have a recorded uh, ROS bag uh, that contained uh, a manually set initial pose. Um, but now it is possible for AutoWare to estimate the initial pose of the Ego vehicle automatically uh, using GNSS, uh, GPS uh, sensor data. And this is a new feature that will be added to AutoWare.auto in the near future. So uh, let's give that a go. So I'm going to go back to my AutoWare Online instance, open a terminal window, split, uh, press Alt.A to do broadcast, change to the AutoWare.proj directory, do source. Um, on the source command, turn off broadcast by pressing Alt plus O. And then I'm going to copy this command, the Rust launch command, and run that here. Okay. And then run the Rust launch command briefly, and then pause it. And then I'm going to go back to RViz. We're going to leave the view type as it is. I'm just going to change this to base link and then zero. And as you can see, we can just see a model, a representation of the car, the ego vehicle, and nothing else. I go back to my paused ROS bag uh, terminal and then I hit spacebar to keep going. And then, first of all, we see the LiDAR data being displayed, the kind of recorded LiDAR data. Um, and then you saw it kind of it kind of reloaded almost like the the view kind of refreshed, um, and that's essentially the matching of the recorded sense data with the map. Uh, we match those two together, and now what we're seeing is um, a view of the data, the the map data, uh, together with the sensor lidar data, all together. Okay, so that's kind of the automatic. Um, matching automatic um, estimation of the initial pose and then which allows us to do the entity matching. Okay, so I'm going to well, pause, I'm gonna cancel or cancel the playback and then run, uh, hit control C in the left terminal as well and close. Right. Um, so what we're going to do next? So this is all. We, this is what we just did. And so now I'm going to show you. Well, it it is possible to um, give that initial pose uh, to to allow entity scan matching um, when we don't have GNSS uh, sensor data. Um, but uh, first we're going to try and replay a ROS bag uh, that doesn't have, it's basically had the GNSS 
uh, since data removed and I just want to show with this exercise what actually happens when you try and uh, play back the ROS bag. So we're going to repeat more or less the same uh, set of commands but with a slightly different ROS bag. So again, um, oops, uh, alt plus A to set broadcast, change directory to the auto add proj directory, uh, source, and then alt plus O turn off broadcast. Um, oops, I've lost my text file. Um, it's only launch command. I mean, the launch command is the same. I could have just used the same one, but anyway. Um, so I'm gonna run launch command. Copy my ROS bag, play command ready. So as we were before, go back to the right terminal, uh, run the ROS bag play command. I'm just gonna hit pause after a second. So, we do the same as we did before. We're going to go to the views panel and just set this to the base link and then click zero. And then I'm going to replay. Okay, so again, as before, we see the sensor data, LiDAR sensor data being uh, replayed. And even after a few seconds, you'll note that we don't get that matching. Um, between the center data and the map data because there's no initial pose. Uh, we don't have the GNSS sense data uh, in the ROS bag. And so that matching can't take place. Okay. So we're gonna try that again uh, using the same ROS bag file. So we're gonna basically run the commands, same commands again. Um, um, but this time we're actually going to set the initial pose. So open a new terminal window, split vertically, uh, alt plus a to run, uh, broadcast commands, so cd auto edit proj, and then the source command. And then Alt plus O to turn off broadcast. And I'm just going to use previous use command history. Uh, so that's the Ross launch command. Okay. Uh, I'm going to go to my right terminal. Um, so this time we're going to play the Ross bag file for a few seconds, around five five seconds or so. Um, and the reason being that um, playing the file, when, when the file starts playing, it, it basically kicks off uh, additional um, modules uh, within AutoWare that need to run and that are necessary for us to be able to set the initial pose. Um, in particular, things like uh, ROS time need to be kind of running. So I'm gonna hit enter. Leave it. Okay, and I'm gonna pause. And we go back to our viz and scroll down. And so this time we're gonna set an initial pose. Um, and it needs to be roughly where the car is. If you if you set the initial pose somewhere that's really far off, uh, the scan matching is gonna fail. And so um, the, the car will be placed where we put it on the map, but it's not gonna match the actual position. And so for example, if I set the, if I set the initial pose all the way back here, um, we would kind of take that and then we'd see the car kind of driving off. It turned left and it wouldn't actually be matching the map at all. So uh, the initial pose needs to be in, in approximately the right place. And so we know from before that the car, the eager vehicle is at the stop line here at this intersection. So I click the 2D pose button and then you have to click and hold the left mouse button. And then as you're holding the mouse button, you can set the 
the direction of the vehicle. Um, that is actually an arrow. It's quite small, but that's an arrowhead. Um, and so if I drag it, if I drag and, and hold in this direction and then let go of the mouse button, I set the initial pose. And then I'm going to set target frame to base link again and hit zero. Um, then go back to the uh, rust bag. The terminal is playing the rust bag and hit spacebar to keep playing uh, and as you can see um, we've kind of matched the sense data again so before uh, I started replaying and I zeroed in on the base link um, of the, the vehicle we could just see the sense data that's being replayed but um, after setting the initial um, so even though we took the initial pose we just had the, the paused kind of data um, but after I started um, playing resuming a uh, replay of the ROS bank after we set the initial pose, um, the ND scan matching algorithm was able to kind of complete as it were. We were able to match the data um, and um, able to match that site, the, the, the scan data, um, the LIDAR uh, data with the map data, uh, even though we did not have um, any kind of uh, GNSS sense data that would have allowed us to automatically set that initial pose. Okay. Uh, so that's the end of the exercise. I'm just going to close uh, the ROS launch command. Uh, can't, well, control C to, to kill the command um, and close the window, the terminal window to finish. Okay, from there we are going to go straight into the uh, next exercise, which is um, which is basically to work with the planning simulator. So, how can you test AutoAir if you don't have a, a ROS bag of recorded sense data? You can still do testing, uh, and you can test basically the planning uh, and control parts of AutoAir. Okay, so we come to we now uh, come to exercise four, the final exercise, where we will be working with AutoWare's planning simulator, which can be used for a variety of uh, things, such as uh, validating vector maps. Uh, vector maps are essentially the uh, metadata about your uh, roads, road rules, uh, traffic light locations, stop lines, intersections, that kind of thing. Um, and also things like um, you can also use the simulator to verify, verify Autoway's route planning functionality. Um, and for this exercise, we're only going to use a single terminal window. So uh, open our terminal window. And then going to change to the autoware.proj directory. As always, uh, run the source command. To set up our environments and then we're going to run uh, a ROS launch command which is looks very similar but it's this time we're running the planning simulator and then start that okay it's a different map this time uh, so first Going to click 2D pose estimate and set uh, the initial pose of our vehicle by clicking, uh, click and hold, and then drag the mouse in the direction you want. And then we set, and then I'm going to set the goal pose by clicking 2D nav goal. Again, click, drag, and then release. And we can see our route has been set there. Um, so the other things you can do with this is you can set uh, dummy objects and you can set them running um, around um, the, the the map uh, to see how the ego vehicle uh, responds to them um, or how it shows them how it how it detects them essentially. So if I click on 2D dummy pedestrian, I can drag same as setting uh, pose for the vehicle ego vehicle click and hold and drag to set the position and then release and then our pedestrian goes off um, 
and then we can do the same for a car. So like I said, a dummy vehicle goes along the road, crossing the routes, and it will go off at a steady velocity. Uh, if we look at the tool properties panel in the bottom left, uh, we can see these. So that was 2D dummy pedestrian, has a velocity of one. And if you scroll down a bit further, we see 2D dummy car has a velocity of three. So we can actually set these, we can adjust these. So if we wanted to have stationary um, pedestrian or stationary vehicle, we can set these both to zero. Uh, which is only going to affect uh, new objects that we place on the view. Uh, existing objects will basically uh, keep the properties they had uh, when they were placed on the view. Uh, and indeed, you can't actually see now, but I think those those objects basically just keep going off into the distance. They don't actually, there's no boundary on their movements. So and once you start the moving, they will just keep going off into the, into the great unknown there. So, uh, but now since we've set the velocity to be zero, if I add a pedestrian, let's say on this street, on this corner of the intersection, it will just stay there without moving. And then same for a dummy vehicle. If I was to put one uh, alongside the road, it just will stay there in position. Um, okay, so now the next step is to actually get the uh, get the vehicle to follow this route that we've laid out. Uh, this route's a little bit boring now that I come to think about it. So I'm going to click 2D Nav Go and set a slightly different route. So it actually does some turning. And then I'm going to switch to third person follower. Target frame to base link and then click zero. And then just the view slightly. And so you can see this uh, stationary dummy car we put is, is just there and move without, you know, just there in place. Okay, so to, so to get the actual vehicle moving, we have to use a web UI. So if you click on the Chrome icon and then click on the bookmark, should be saved there, which is the Autoware web controller. And uh, this is essentially the web UI that is used to control uh, for the planning simulator um, and also used to control when the vehicle is being driven autonomously. Uh, and you can change things like you can set the lane change approval, so whether it's set to true at the moment. So if there was an object blocking the lane, uh, AutoWare would uh, check to see if it was safe to change lanes and then the vehicle would change lane automatically um, but if this approval if this is um, this is not set to true um, and uh, lane changing is not approved then if there was an obstacle in the lane that the vehicle's in it will just stop behind it until that vehicle moves off or until um, the safety driver uh, takes manual control and changes lane you can also set a velocity limit for uh, the vehicle and then you have these two uh, engages, uh, engage controls, uh, vehicle engage and auto engage. And so to get our vehicle moving, we have to click both of these. So we click vehicle engage and then auto wear engage. And then when I click this button, you'll see the auto wear state uh, says waiting for engage. It will change from waiting to engage to driving. Under autonomous driving, have fun. The message tells us and if we click back on our viz, we can see our vehicle is duly moving off and there's our stationary pedestrian at the intersection that we placed earlier and so we make our right turn go straight make our left turn and come to the end well, at come to our goalpost where the vehicle will then come to a stop. And uh, that is the end of the exercise. So if you go to your terminal, hit Control C, 
Um, we can close the terminal now, close the browser, uh, close the text file if you had it open. Uh, and as a last uh, point, if you can go to the home page of the autoway.online page, and if you can click the pause button to uh, stop your instance, uh, that would be, and click, click the OK button, that would be uh, much appreciated. But uh, that is the end of the, the hands-on exercises. Thank you very much for your participation. Okay, so we're back. Right. So, um, thank you. I hope, uh, hope for the rest of you, uh, people that have, uh, just uh, will stay on for the, the rest of the talking part of the workshop, as that's the, the, the hands-on parts have all finished. Um, so, uh, as I hope I've been clear um, from the outset, Autoware is an open source project. And as a result, it's a project that depends on its developer community. Uh, and we are always looking for more contributors. Um, through the, although the Autoware.ai project will go into maintenance mode for next year, as I mentioned, it's still a good introduction to the basics of Autoware and a way of testing the waters uh, before diving in with uh, something like the Autoware.auto project. Um, I've also included details of the Autoware architecture proposal code uh, that form the basis of the hands-on exercises that we've just done. Uh, since these changes are planned to be added to Autoware.auto in the near future and something that we highly recommend viewing or reviewing. And so the uh, so the slides contain links to uh, various uh, the various projects, um, contribution guidelines, support guidelines, uh, and then also the the Autoware.ai, the Autoware.auto, and the Autoware architecture proposal uh, projects. So. Uh, please take a look and I hope that some of you will be interested in joining and, and um, contributing. So the next part of the presentation is to talk about ARM and AutoWare um, and to talk about um, the, the steps that are taken and the things that are being done to get uh, AutoWare working on ARM-based architecture. Um, at the moment, to get good performance of AutoWare, there's no other choice but to use an in expensive industrial-like PC based on kind of general off-the-shelf components um, and with an x86 architecture uh, CPU. Uh, these kind of systems can be large, difficult to manage, and can require a lot of power as well. Uh, on top of that, the, uh, the computational processing required to move towards a fully autonomous vehicle is increasing day by day as, as the technology improves and we get closer to the, the, the goal of a fully autonomous vehicle, uh, the processing power that's required uh, goes up uh, with the complexity and that just serves to make those problems worse. Now, of course, the number of devices you need uh, in the vehicle depend on the requirements uh, for that vehicle and the environment which has to operate. But to give an example, this is what a Japan taxi ECU system looks like. That's uh, quite a lot of computers. Um, this system may look quite unwieldy, but bear in mind this is a proof of concept project that was built using off-the-shelf components. Uh, it includes six perception computers, uh, which technically aren't all necessary. It's not the, the minimum requirement uh, for this, uh, for the taxi to run. Uh, with AutoWare, but um, it was there, the large number was there basically to address some quality issues that we were having uh, and the uh, need to have uh, sufficient processing headroom in the case of any of uh, a perception computer failure. Uh, that said, uh, AutoWare's developers are constantly working on optimizations uh, and it's believed that a solar system will be possible with existing hardware. Uh, however, with ARM based hardware, we believe that much more can be achieved. So uh, the, the current kind of Autoware and ARM roadmap has two main components to it. Uh, the first part is developing an ARMware compatible version of Autoware and uh, developing a dedicated AI accelerator chip. So to talk about those in more detail, as I noted uh, a moment ago, uh, AutoWare can run on a personal laptop, providing you've, you've, it, it meets the minimum tech specs. Uh, but the real world hardware requirements are very different. Um, with an ARM um, 
core system. Uh, we can improve processing efficiency and reduce power consumption for an auto air system, uh, which uh, it's not so much more about x86 versus ARM. It's more about just giving uh, more a wider choice of hardware architecture to auto air users and the ability to choose the appropriate hardware architecture for their needs. Um, so this uh, ability to run um, and being able to run auto and ARM opens up the possibility of going beyond, uh, opening up the scope of hardware beyond Intel and AMD based hardware. Uh, for example, Samsung's LSI Foundry is expected to join in with this work uh, and helping, thus helping to expand the hardware choice options for auto -air users. Okay, in terms of the auto -air accelerator, uh, the reason this is believed to be something that can work or to, can help is that for certain types of autonomous processing, such as localization and perception, um, an AI accelerator chip can help reduce the reliance on uh, GPUs, uh, costly GPUs at that. Um, for localization, the NDT scan matching algorithm is computationally intensive. Uh, due to the requirement of needing to calculate uh, to calculate for every single lidar, uh, every single point in the lidar sensor data, uh, plus it has a large memory footprint due to the need to load HD map data. Uh, this uh, vector map data, uh, sorry, this point cloud map data has to be loaded into memory uh, to match against the sensor data. And um, however, this uh, as an algorithm, it's very well known. And a well-known and, and tried and tested algorithm uh, can be designed, uh, can be optimized against. Uh, and so this is some, uh, an area in which a dedicated accelerator chip can be of great benefit. The second part is perception. Um, so LiDAR point cloud segmentation, which is separating out your uh, point cloud data from sensors into individual objects. Uh, object recognition and traffic light classification are, are over time being moved to, to machine um, neural network based uh, machine learning models for processing. A um, particular model being used is a convolutional neural network and that processing is computationally intensive. Uh, however, an accelerator chip could handle this more efficiently than the GPU. Um, and uh, at a greater rate of frames per second, uh, which is important for higher speed driving. One of the other things that's being worked on is um, AutoWare is working with other AutoWare, um, AutoWare is working with other uh, AutoWare Foundation partners, such as LG, uh, to get AutoWare running with the LG SVL simulator, uh, running to get them running together on ARM-based hardware. The uh, LG simulator, LG SVL simulator, is uh, can be used for end-to-end -end testing of AutoWare from sensing uh, and localization all the way through to uh, and perception all the way through to planning and control. Okay. So the, the last topic to talk about is what's the future in terms of the future strategy for AutoWare. Uh, the two parts of this are algorithm optimization um, and ODD driven development strategy. Uh, in terms of algorithm optimization, algorithms within AutoWare are constantly being optimized based on academic research papers that are coming out uh, as well as internal research conducted by AutoWare Foundation members. So that's kind of an ongoing uh, process um, from the very beginning. Um, but then there's the concept of an ODD driven development strategy, uh, which is uh, the AutoWare Foundation's way of uh, making meaningful progress um, with essentially a, a very diverse group of uh, contributors uh, who have a variety of goals. And some of those goals can be academic goals or commercial goals. And the amount of time that those contributors can dedicate to AutoWare development can vary quite greatly. It can be people, uh, maybe commercial, people are in it for are working on commercial goals or in it for the long haul. Uh, whereas people doing academic research might be only researching for maybe a year or possibly even a shorter period of, of months. And so there's a need to set common goals 
uh, for uh, Autoware Foundation that brings all these contributors together to achieve these uh, achieve those goals in a reasonable time frame, and that is this concept of ODD driven development strategy. So the first point is to what is ODD? Some of you may be thinking. Uh, ODD stands for Operational Design Domain, and it can be thought as thought of as the operating conditions on which a given uh, automated uh, driving system is designed to function, and can include such things as environmental, geographical, and time of day restrictions, traffic conditions, and, and road characteristics, and more besides that. Uh, for example, uh, I could have an ODD, um, so to give an example of the videos, the demonstration videos I showed earlier, um, my ODD was set within the confines of a factory that's uh, private roads uh, with, with no other vehicles, I could say, uh, and only a small number of pedestrians. Um, and I could also state that that ODD only covers good weather conditions, such as uh, clear weather with no rain or snow. Um, alternatively, my ODD uh, could be like this uh, ODD3, uh, on the slide, which could be like a, a robo taxi service set to run within a limited section of a downtown uh, city centre. Okay, so how does this help? Um, the, the point being, um, the development process is based on these ODDs. So there's a kind of these two loops that run. Um, we define, the Autoware Foundation defines the ODD um, that we want to work towards and then we develop support for that ODD within the AutoWare software. Uh, and then once an ODD is defined, we need to define scenarios within that ODD. Uh, and a scenario can be thought of a specific maneuver that the, uh, the ego vehicle needs to perform uh, and they're combined with the environment in which it must perform that maneuver. So an example would be uh, driving straight in our own lane along a straight road with no road signs at midday on a sunny day. That would be an example of a scenario. However, AutoWare allows for parameterized scenarios that can be varied easily and in a machine readable format. So uh, automated testing can be done in a continuous integration system uh, with those parameters being varied. So we're covering a broader range of scenarios types. So the, the points to take away from this are that um, the Autoware Foundation's development efforts are focused on ODDs or driven by ODDs rather than specific applications or use cases. Um, focus is on one ODD at a time uh, and that each one is chosen must be a kind of sensible progression from the previous one rather than a large technological leap. Um, each ODD should also be uh, provide some increase in capability to the previous one. Uh, rather than just being an application of current functionality in a different ODD. Uh, and in this way, the Autoware Foundation ensures that Autoware's compatibility shows progression over time by achievable, clearly defined goals. And so to finish, uh, I'd like to show a demo video that was created by another Autoware member, uh, Autoware Foundation member, Autocore. Uh, shown this system is using a hybrid x86 uh, and ARM uh, based system. Uh, and X8, the x86 system is based for, is used for hardware, the autoware visualization and the ARM based components uh, in, the, in the back of the vehicle, in the trunk of the vehicle are, are used for planning and for perception. And uh, the power used uh, for this system is around 100 watts. Um, and for comparison purposes, the uh, Japan Taxi ECU shown earlier was around 400 to 500 watts.
I should note that this is a, in case anyone was wondering, this is a pure uh, demonstration of functionality um, that AutoCore very kindly uh, put together for us at short notice. Um, I, I'm, I'm getting the feeling that uh, as this is the end of the presentation or the end of the workshop, we should have had some more uh, arousing kind of soundtrack attached to, to build up enthusiasm, but uh, unfortunately not. And that brings us to the end of the uh, workshop. I hope that you, turn my video on to finish. Uh, I hope that uh, those of you that the participants uh, have, uh, uh, that you've, uh, you've enjoyed the workshop, uh, enjoyed uh, having a, a little bit of a, a kind of a hands-on experience with uh, AutoWare. And that some of you may be inspired to uh, to delve into AutoWare in a bit more detail and to potentially contribute um, to the project. And um, so thank you very much for attending. Uh, once again, hope you enjoyed it. And uh, we'll now move to Q&A that will be handled by uh, um, a colleague of mine. In terms of the questions, it's possible that there may be questions asked that cannot be answered at this time. Maybe some of you have some in-depth questions or you know, kind of questions, uh, algorithm level questions or source code level questions. Uh, if that's the case, what we plan to do is to take down the questions and then I will update the uh, GitHub repository that included all of the instructions for the workshop. I'll basically add another page to that that will have all the questions written down along with the answers uh, to those questions. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not gonna be able to say when that will be. I'll try and get it done. Um, I'll, try, I'll try and make sure that's done uh, within October. Um, so what I would suggest is that you maybe star or um, yeah, you, you kind of mark those re the repository uh, so that you'll see updates on it and then check back for those updates to your answers. So. Um, thank you, and uh, once again, and uh, now it will be on to the Q&A.